Good morning. Today we'll talk about fiscal policy in the European Monetary Union, um, in particular the way the Monetary Union has uh, restrained the behavior of individual member governments to, to do the only thing they can do. As we learned uh, in a fixed exchange rate regime, monetary policy is, is non-existent. Fiscal policy is the only option. So if a country has a, an asymmetric shock that it'd like to react to, it uh, has to use fiscal policy um, under the conditions of uh, monetary union. And therefore, um, it has to have the ability to do so. And its ability to do so is based is conditioned by its ability to borrow in the capital markets if it wants to increase spending or cut taxes. And under those conditions, uh, this is a, a straitjacket for many countries, especially after the great financial crisis um, and the sovereign debt crisis that we'll talk about in the last lecture. Uh, just to remind you, the examination is, uh, has the uh, usual format. We'll do a true-false uncertain part uh, if it's false or uncertain, you're expected to write one or two sentences to explain why. Be brief. Uh, there'll be a fill-in-the-box um, question as well. And uh, two out of three uh, longer essay questions. We have to draw a graph or explain yourself in detail. And of course, we'll uh, give a, a sample um, uh, of questions that you can look at and work on. And Befin will review those in the... In the review section, okay. Um, I also like to remind you to take the um, the evaluation uh, seriously. It's important for us. We don't have that many um, chances to get feedback from you, and uh, a lot of you are kind of too shy. Here's a chance to really tell tell us what you think about the course, and we'd appreciate it if you could do this. We've made it very easy for you. It's on the Moodle page. You just have to go to the box on the upper right hand corner when you're logged in and just um, and just answer those questions. Thank you very much for that. Uh, support. Today we're going to review last week's lecture briefly and we'll speak about, um, again, remind you of the relevance of fiscal policy in the monetary union in the context of the last three weeks. We've talked about um, the fact that giving up your monetary tool, uh, which some countries don't want to do for national reasons, nationalistic reasons, but also maybe for policy reasons or maybe for reasons of preference of inflation. Um, means that fiscal policy has to do double duty. It has to be able to react quickly and uh, effectively. And we already know that in a small open economy, the multiplier is lower, so the, the, the scope for fiscal policy is limited anyway. So ultimately, um, fiscal policy um, is, is going to be important, and it may be necessary to have a central government, um, as in the United States or Canada or China, that would uh, provide some extra leeway for the local governments to do more um, typical Keynesian uh, tax and expenditure policy. And basically today's lecture is going to be about sustainability. So the buzzword in the environmental world is sustainability. It's also an important concept in fiscal policy. What types of fiscal policies are sustainable, i.e. are consistent with um, a country fulfilling its um, national uh, budget constraint. When I say national, I mean the government budget constraint consolidating federal, um, uh, local, and intermediate authorities together, all fiscal budgets together like the OECD does. And we'll arrive at a couple of important equations that you'll have to commit to memory for the exam. Um, this is an important uh, thing to remember, why debt grows, why it grows as a fraction of GDP, and of course, why it grows absolutely and what does it take to stabilize uh, the debt level at some level? Uh, what would it require f of the tax and expenditure levels uh, relative to GDP to make this happen at a given rate of interest and a given rate of growth? So all those things will come together. Uh, we learned this in Macro 2. Most of you have taken Macro 2, but this will be um, an important um, extension of that information and maybe a little bit more derivation of what, where that comes from. And I'll try to relate that to the Maastricht criteria. The Maastricht criteria is not going to be the same um, or is not the same set of conditions that we learn or the condition we learn to get stable debt uh, levels or st stable debt to GDP, but it is in intimately related. In a country that fulfills the Maastricht criteria will indeed fulfill this debt stabilization criterion. 
Um, but of course, the Maastricht criteria um, has an extra degree of freedom, which means that it could actually be more severe under certain conditions. We'll review that as well. And then finally, I'll talk about the, the potential of government policy to work on why bar the uh, underlying GDP potential in an economy, uh, which of course is um, never the, the subject of Keynesian economics or analysis, but it might be possible for a country to, to undertake policies that will of course require several years of patience, but uh, we've seen that it's worked in, in Ireland, it worked in uh, Denmark in the 1980s, worked in Ireland in the 1990s and 2000s, it uh, appears to be possibly working in Greece right now, after all those terrible years of Greek uh, misery. Uh, so supply policy um, is possible, and fiscal policy would be maybe adjusting taxes and expenditures to enhance the supply side, i.e. infrastructure investment, investing in better courts, and, and adjudication of conflicts, as well as um, making the, the tax system more efficient and less distortionary and less and possibly less corrupt. And um, I'll give a, a prelude to the discussion of next week, um, which is the final lecture of the course. Okay, so that was a very long introduction. Let me get going. Uh, last week we talked about the optimal currency area. We defined an, a region. We talked about Mundell's conceptualization of an optimal currency area um, using sort of a Pareto criterion. No region should be made less well off or worse off uh, because of the adoption of a common currency. If that's the case, then almost naturally uh, it occurs to many people that some sort of fiscal transfer system might be required to make that happen. But Mundell was thinking first in the very narrow box of demand management and um, in a sense um, also supply management in the sense of moving factors. Uh, he talked primarily about labor. I talk more generally about capital and labor being mobile, as well as the symmetry of shocks. Uh, these criteria were modified by McKinnon, uh, who appealed to the openness of the economy as being an uh, interesting aspect that might be uh, important. And Keenan talked about the diversification of a, the output structure of an economy as making it easier to join a monetary uh, union. And of course, the relevance of fiscal policy is the subject of today's lecture. And then finally, the, the Barrow-Gordon uh, angle, which is simply common preferences or aligned preferences over inflation um, is probably a necessary condition because countries uh, won't want to join a monetary union that restrains their policy options so much that they can't use a surprise inflation or a, a surge of inflation or a surge of monetary um, expansion to uh, make the economy move um, in a certain direction. And even though we know that in the long run monetary policy is neutral, we're pretty convinced of that. It's almost like a, an article of faith. Um, then it really only makes sense in terms of your time perspective and maybe the political pressure. Um, maybe you're trying to win the next election, but those things can be important. And that's what Barrow and Gordon did in the, in, when they looked at this um, many, many years ago in the 1980s. So this is a even the 1970s. So this is a, a fascinating area, and you should remember the diagram that we uh, studied very, very intensely last week. We also finally discussed whether Europe is an optimal currency area, and I think you, you understood my message. The answer is yein, okay, because uh, in, in the sense of the original Benelux, uh, Germany, France uh, core, uh, the conditions were met, and certainly more than, than met after uh, the common uh, exchange rate system, the fixed exchange rate system of the e EMS was implemented, but countries like Italy and uh, Southern Europe in general took a little bit longer. Even Denmark, you might have questioned the, 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 the appropriateness of a, of a monetary union at the time, but over time things have gotten more and more synchronized and uh, there's more and more potential for, um, for a common currency. Um, therefore, um, Maybe we should put the brakes on. If we expect a, a real appreciation in Poland over the next 10 to 15 years, probably not a good idea for them to join now, but in the long run, it will certainly be so. And we saw already from Poland that the real exchange rate between Poland and Germany, uh, the bilateral exchange rate is, is remarkably stable, meaning that if it's not the intention of the Polish National Bank uh, to maintain the real exchange rate, then it certainly uh, appears like trade integration,
has uh, taken care of that job for us. We looked at this wonderful picture that you should commit to memory, which is a, basically a flow chart as how uh, we should take this decision. So at the very top, we look at the, the openness and product differentiation, thinking of McKinnon and, and Kinnon as sort of a four, um, um, a four filter, sort of a, a pre-filter of, of countries that might, or regions that might be candidates. Then we look at the Mundell criteria, um, the, the, uh, especially the, the uh, symmetry of shocks. Um, if we need adjustment, we're gonna have to have price and, flex, price and wage flexibility um, with respect to nominal uh, prices in terms of the monetary union. If we don't, then we're gonna need adjustment, possibly supply side adjustment like Mundell talked about in terms of labor mobility, but also maybe capital mobility. That would be my adjustment. Um, and if this fails, we'll probably need some political support. And political support presumes that people are willing to make transfers, possibly long run transfers, but certainly an insurance system, homogeneity of preferences. People have to have the same averseness to inflation or aversion to inflation uh, and have to have the same level of solidarity. And, and maybe the, the, uh, the nature of uh, the beast says we have to care about our Greek um, brothers and friends as much as we care about our own uh, residents of the country that we're living in. Okay, so it's not really clear. Um, it seems like this is a dynamic concept as Europe and the European Monetary Union continues to succeed uh, and uh, countries find it more and more attractive to hang their hat on the, on the rack. Then we'll see more and more countries joining. This is a little bit like the spirit of Helmut Schmidt and uh, uh, Giscard d'Estaing when the uh, EMS um, was founded, the European Monetary System was founded in 1978. Okay, so let's talk about fiscal policy. That's the objective of today's lecture. We're gonna talk about the, the, um, the, uh, the reason it's important. I mentioned that in the introduction. It's important because it affects aggregate demand in the short run. Um, it might be useful in the case of the, pa the pandemic to coordinate because all countries were hit by the same shock. But here I'm talking about really a region or a country that's hit by an asymmetric shock and needs to perform some asymmetric fiscal policy. We learned already under what conditions it's most potent, clearly in a flexible exchange rate regime, less so, fixed exchange rate regime more so, but a fixed exchange rate regime with an open economy that's very open will also have a fairly impotent fiscal, fiscal policy just because the multiplier is so low. It'll still be some, have some effectiveness, but it'd be most effective if we could get all the regions to do the same thing at the same time. So openness, as McKenna reminded us, is another reason uh, to have monetary uh, union, but it's also a reason to possibly have a fiscal union if the regions are all very, very small. But in the same time, we know that fiscal policy can have an effect, and we saw that in the individual countries um, following the the, uh, the crisis, the expansion of fiscal policy did have uh, effects in raising inflation and the recent uh, conflict in, in Ukraine will certainly uh, bring uh, more fiscal uh, activity, more fiscal spending uh, on the expenditure side, more military expenditures, which will also shift the AD curve to the right. Uh, and this will have a positive effect on inflation as capacity constraints are hit and firms start to raise prices in anticipation of future uh, tightness in uh, product and labor markets. Okay. This is all fine and good, but at the se in some fundamental sense, we've kind of begged the question. We have really ignored the idea that fiscal policy has to be financed. So if you do expand military expenditure, if you do build a few bridges, if you do uh, add a north-south um, internet highway or uh, power, power lines, um, as is being discussed now to bring the northern wind energy to the southern part of Germany, uh, this is gonna be expensive and it's gonna, have to, it's gonna cost money, so unless you have the tax revenues, you're gonna have to borrow money and pay it back in the future. That's what fiscal policy is about. So smoothing the, the tax burden by borrowing and uh, paying future taxes as well. This means that basically um, the real effects of, of fiscal policy um, need to be financed by debt issue. 
And the debt issue must be consistent with markets' expectations that the debt will be serviced. Otherwise, uh, it's a free lunch, and, and capital markets don't like free lunches. So we'll rule out seniorage because monetary policy is not possible, and therefore it's really all about, um, about um, current and future um, primary um, government budget surpluses. Now, of course, the central bank um, could finan finance this, and there is a central bank in a monetary union, but it's at the supranational level, and indeed, um, the danger is that countries might call the bluff of the central bank saying we want to have our own monetary policy and say, look, we're going to issue a lot of debt and we're going to see what you do about it. Um, and if, if you're too big uh, to fail, it will be uh, impossible for the central bank to say no and it will eventually monetize, i.e. purchase uh, the debt on open markets um, in order to save the union. So one interpretation of what happened in 20. Uh, the announcement in 2013, 2012, 2013, that the euro, the euro would, uh, all the, would that Mario Draghi would do all that it takes to save the euro is kind of a, uh, a statement that this is um, definitely uh, in the arsenal of central banks' uh, weapons. And the central bank is always expected to serve as a lender of last resort in the case of the financial crisis. And the euro uh, sovereign debt crisis was a financial crisis. It wasn't the American crisis. The European Central Bank also reacted to the American crisis in 2008 and 9, and of course there was spillover and blowback as European banks were, were drawn into the crisis because of their financing of the American mortgage uh, catastrophe. Okay, so the, um, the, the, the story goes on because right now the European Central Bank, uh, even within countries, might be implicated in financing government debt because um, Implicitly, countries that have deficits uh, may run imbalances with other regions in the monetary union. And uh, just as a bookkeeping uh, issue, uh, there is no way beyond the fact that central banks at a fixed exchange rate have to finance any insufficiency of the private capital market to finance um, regions or countries that have current account deficits with other member countries. This is what the target two system is all about, basically um, almost a safety valve, if you like. It's a bookkeeping valve. Uh, it, normally, if, if, if we had floating exchange rates, the, the exchange rate would, would move until capital, um, private capital s is sufficient to finance any uh, current account in imbalance within uh, the system. But when you have fixed exchange rates, this is literally done technically by the central banks. We'll talk more about that next, uh, next week. So all these things make, mean fiscal policy is double, has double relevance in a monetary union. And again, we talked already about what happens if there is a demand-driven recession in one region. So suppose Germany has a recession uh, relative to the rest of the European monetary union or is hit by a supply shock as is the case right now. What, is the, um, what do we do? Well, fiscal policy is appropriate if it's a demand shock. If it's supply shock, um, Sorry, uh, you're going to just have to accept it because there's not much the government can do. It can't, uh, you know, sort of start its own. Uh, it can try to subsidize uh, capital formation, uh, structural change, accelerate it. But we think of the supply side as being this sort of lumbering uh, tanker, which is driven by long-run um, considerations that, that that we know from the solo model, um, and therefore. Um, we need to make a judgment whether or not a fiscal uh, policy intervention is even called for or even possible. Um, I refer to the case of Italy. This is real GDP in, in the Italian economy in, in real terms. This is the absolute size of the Italian economy since 1995. So you see a fairly robust, and these are just, these are un, these are not logarithm, logarithmic, uh, uh, graphs I'm going to show you. These are absolute levels of, uh, so these are very large numbers, of course, but, and you'd expect them to be growing exponentially, so the, the, what we have is a slowing of Italian growth, but still extremely significant positive growth until the financial crisis, and then we have um, two sort of very large declines that have never really been made up for. So Italy has really lost, if you like, uh, a huge amount of output, output potential, 
we're talking, uh, you know, maybe on the order of five to, to ten percent of the economy. Um, and you ask, where does that where did that go? Well, part of it is um, withdrawn labor supply. The other part is maybe a lack of investment. If you if you visited places like Sardinia, you see that um, replacement investment has been very deficient. Uh, you see, I'm just looking at the at the the, the 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 factories and the steel mills that have been uh, mothballed have not been used in, in decades uh, as an indication of that. So this lost potential in Italy can't be rep can't be re um, repaired with a with an expansionary fiscal policy. There's just no question that Italy needs some fundamental structural change to utilize its resources better. Now, of course, Italy is a, has a shrinking labor force. Um, by all practical purposes, it's lost a lot of competitiveness to China, so maybe this is just a natural, possibly optimal reaction to the, uh, to the, inc the incursion of the Chinese and the, and the Italian markets um, that Italy was so famous for 30 or 40 years ago. Um, if you look at um, another country, um, when we look at the same country after the pandemic, you see that this is just for, for dramatic reasons. I want to show you how much of a further decline in Italian GDP was, was, uh, was in the cards after the pandemic occurred. And there has been some recovery. So um, with all due respect, Italy has recovered to exceed its pre-pandemic uh, levels, but it's still way below those, those levels of 1995. So this is a supply shock in the strongest possible terms. Um, we need to think about that. Europe is not just a um, need. I mean, we really need to, to stop thinking only about the demand side. Here's a good case of Germany. You see, Germany has a similar issue, although Germany recovers its growth path um, in the most recent um, uh, year, in the most recent year since the, uh, the Crimean um, and the Russian, <laughs> the Ukrainian conflict. The Crimean War was quite a while ago. Um, it has recovered, but we have the same phenomenon in Germany. Um, a lot of German industry will have become um, non-competitive because of this relative price increase of energy. Uh, Germany is a very energy-intensive economy. It's not surprising that the, for the same reason that ceramic uh, production in Italy will become uh, less competitive because of gas prices, Germany will lose competitiveness in, uh, in chemicals and uh, pharmaceuticals because this production has become very expensive. And of course, industry is lobbying for adjustment and, and adjustment assistance, et cetera. Um, but um, the writing is on the wall. But if you think these two countries have a problem, take a look at Greece. Okay, so Greece is really a, the poster child of a structural uh, adjustment problem. Um, but we probably had up until the, the financial crisis wasn't just an overbuilding of, of, of apartments and buildings and hotels in Greece uh, financed by cheap money uh, in the European Monetary Union. Uh, Greece is still yet to recover, despite very, very strong uh, recent data that I don't have in this picture. Uh, Greece is still well below um, its um, pre-financial crisis levels. So Greece is serious. So this is, the reason I mention this is because why bar is the basis for a sustainable fiscal policy. Greece needs enough fiscal revenues to finance and service uh, the debt that it's accumulated and possibly will accumulate in the future. Um, this is going to be the shadow hanging over all the countries that want to use fiscal policy uh, in a monetary union. Okay, so let's do some analytic um, uh, exercises to remind ourselves what this actually means for the long-run growth rate of the economy in real terms, the long-run rate of interest, the inflation rate, the nominal interest rate, and of course the primary uh, government surplus. When I mention the when I talk about the primary government surplus, I'm talking about net taxes minus expenditures on goods and services in each period. And that's a flow, okay? Not the it's the it's the if you add to that the 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 debt. The, um, the interest burden for the budget, that would be the total headline deficit that we read about in the newspaper. So let's put a, try to put this all together in one single equation. The single equation is simply what we call the fundamental stabilization equation um, for the public stock of debt. When I say public debt stock, I mean all debt consolidated at, the, at all levels, central government level, state level, in Germany, the Gemeinden, the, the local 
uh, uh, local governments as well. Okay, so let's use some symbols and, uh, and get rolling. I'm going to use B to denote the real stock of debt. So this is the, the stock of nominal debt divided by some price index, and my price index is going to be the GDP deflator. Okay, the GDP deflator is, uh, is for me synonymous with the price level. I won't be distinguishing between import and export prices um, and uh, prices of goods that are not produced at home. So let's do, do this as we, just as we did in macro uh, two. Okay, and we're gonna, we're gonna basically define the rate of inflation as the first derivative of P with respect to T divided by the price level. So it's like, um, it's, it's, and, and if, you, if you don't like calculus, it's not D, DP, uh, DT divided by P, it'll be delta P divided by delta T divided by P. Okay, so that's, it's a number that you can all calculate. You can take first differences of the logarithms of the price index and get the same as an approximation for small changes. Okay, that's gonna be pi. And then why is the, as usual, symbol standing for real GDP? So nominal GDP is PY. And real GDP is gonna be assumed to grow at the solo determined growth rate, call it G. Okay, so we can derive the important, um, the important quantities for us in this analysis. One is gonna be nominal GDP, and one is gonna be the nominal stock of government debt. So I just multiply by the respective in, uh, indice, index numbers. And I is the nominal interest rate in, measured as per period, so per, per unit. You can also do it in continuous time. We won't do that. We'll do it a, on a year-to-year -year basis. Uh, think of R as being the real interest rate. So by the Fisher equation, I minus pi is equal to R. We won't distinguish between inflation expected and inflation realized. We'll just take a deterministic um, perfect foresight perspective. Um, and therefore, the final most important thing to remind us is what the primary surplus or primary deficit is. So we'll be talking about the primary surplus later on, a couple of slides later, but right now, we'll talk about the thing you read about in the newspaper. Um, uh, and it is also a quantity that every good student in economics understands, the difference between the primary uh, deficit and the overall or headline deficit um, so the primary deficit would simply be the expenditures on goods and services, excluding interest, and subtract off of that net taxes, so ta net taxes are gross taxes that people pay, minus the transfers that they receive. Okay? So that's the primary deficit. The primary surplus would be T minus G. Okay? So remember, net taxes we define as the total tax revenues minus transfers. So it's the government takes and, and receives and takes and receives and receives and takes. And basically, well, hopefully that the net of that activity is going to be um, positive in the sense that it takes more than it receives. But as we know in Germany, a lot is, is given back, okay, redistributed in certain ways. Okay, but what really matters for the government's necessity to issue more debt is going to be the, 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 uh, the net taxes um, in as much as they don't cover uh, the expenditures on goods and services, i.e. my wages, the wages of policemen, um, expenditures on building uh, infrastructure, paying for schools, etc. I'm ignoring the government's ability in this setup to issue money. And that's the whole point. You're in a monetary union. Germany cannot issue Deutsche Marks anymore. Italy cannot issue uh, money to pay uh, for its deficit. So it's all a fiscal affair. It's, it's going to be about taxes. It's going to be about net taxes and spending. So let's now take the, this is the key equation. I'm going to derive this very slowly so everybody gets it on, gets it uh, correct, correctly. Think of the change of the stock of debt. Okay, the gross stock of, of government debt evolves in a period of time as the following. It's going to be a the sum of the rate of change or the change in BP that's due to a change in the price level, that's the rate of inflation, and the change of the debt stock as a rate of growth that's, a, that's due to a deficit. Because B changes because the deficit, the nominal deficit is positive, and it shrinks if the, if the government is running a balance. Okay, so we can rewrite that equation just by factoring out PB, 
What is PB? PB is the stock of debt in nominal terms. So we've derived the absolute change in the debt stock as a function of the stock of debt times a bunch of rates of change, okay, or rates. One rate is the rate of inflation, and the second is the, the headline deficit is a fraction of the total stock of debt in real terms. So it's G minus T, which is the primary, def is the, is the primary deficit in real terms. RB is the real uh, debt burden, and B is the, of course, the stock of debt. So we can, re we can simplify this quickly, and we also know that delta B is equal to the primary uh, deficit plus the interest service. We learned that in, in macro two. It should be obvious to you that if you can't if you can't raise enough taxes and you want to be solvent, you're going to have to borrow money. So basically, you're going to have to keep up with your debt service and then some. So you see that the, the, the notion is if you want to stabilize delta B, you're probably going to have to get G down or T up. You're going to have to, raise t you're going to, have to lower spending uh, or raise taxes. Again, this is assuming inflation is correctly anticipated, which is the, the, bench, the benchmark uh, assumption. So when, um, for any positive real stock of debt, this debt will grow as long as the, the interest rate is positive, okay? The real interest rate is positive. It may not be positive all the time, but in the long run, it will be positive. And um, as long as the, the government has a positive uh, deficit, real primary deficit, okay? So now, using that equation, I'm gonna show you how we stabilize this object. We wanna stabilize we don't want to stabilize the absolute level of debt. We want to stabilize the level of debt relative to GDP. Why? Because in a growing economy, the tax base is growing, so naturally it will be possible to sustain a larger stock of debt over time. So it is possible in principle for the government to use that extra tax base to finance um, a growing debt stock. But it can't do this in an unlimited fashion. It's, it's constrained by... Uh, the laws of, of mathematics, or if you, if you like, okay? It's also constrained by the laws of economics, so people must be willing to hold this debt, and that is a, the presumption that the interest rate is given is, a, is an assumption that people are, are, have a credible uh, reason to, to, to believe that the government will, re, will continue to, to finance, uh, to service its debt in the future. It need not be the commitment to pay back all the debt forever, it's not necessary. If an economy continues to grow, this is certainly not necessary. Okay, so what we're asking basically is what is the condition that makes this ratio constant? So the ratio is PB divided by PY. So we want the delta of PB relative to PY to be equal to zero. And that left-hand side is changing. That ratio is changing as a function of the rate of change, or the change in the absolute change in the numerator minus the change in the denominator. When the numerator and the denominator are growing at the same rate, the, the ratio is constant, and then we've, we've achieved stabilization. So think of this as a race. It's a race between the numerator, PB, the stock of debt, and the denominator, uh, the level of nominal GDP. Okay, so remember, P is changing in both, so you can imagine that the the change in P will sort of cancel to some extent, and it will, we'll show that directly. Um, but it's important to maybe do it in steps. Okay, so we want the numerator, PB, to grow at the same rate, that's the left-hand side, as the denominator, the right-hand side, the change of PY divided by PY. What is the right-hand side? The right-hand side is just the nominal rate of growth. And what is the nominal rate of growth? It's the inflation rate plus G, the rate of real GDP growth. That's the right-hand side. The left-hand side is a little bit more complicated, but we learned already that change in BP is equal to the price level, right, times um, the change in, in BP, which is the, the primary deficit, G minus T. The rest cancels, okay? And if you cancel um, P, um, you see that, that the price level is neutral in this equation on the left-hand side. What's, what matters, of course, is the inflation rate, which appears both on the right-hand side and on the left-hand side embedded in the nominal interest rate I. 
Okay. So the left-hand side is basically the ratio of the primary deficit plus the nominal interest payments um, based on the stock of debt B divided by B. So for stability, that object on the left-hand side has to be equal to the nominal rate of growth of the economy. Remember, the nominal rate of growth in the economy in an economy like Germany is the inflation rate plus the rate of growth that you read about in real terms at constant prices. Okay? So if we do a little bit of mathematical magic, a little bit of arithmetic arrangement, rearrangement, we can see that this is the same thing as, because inflation is on both sides, you know, we can use the Fisher equation to eliminate it. We have the real interest rate on the right-hand side, and you can see this, this equation is the one that you learned in macro. So all I do is just kind of move the B to the right-hand side, divide both sides by Y, and we see that the stability condition for the debt-to-GDP ratio is enforcing equality between the primary surplus, T minus G, relative to GDP Y, Okay, so T minus G divided by Y has to be equal to something that is related to the debt stock relative to GDP, but it's not the interest rate, it's the interest rate adjusted by the growth of the economy. Okay, so the primary surplus has to be big enough, it has to equal the rate of interest in real terms minus the growth rate times this number we've looked at many times in the past, the debt burden as a as relative to GDP. So nowadays people talk about America, 110, 120% of GDP. Uh, Greece uh, was as high as 180%. It's coming down um, for, for reasons we'll discuss in a second. Um, Germany um, was very proud to have it around 50%. Now it's um, pushing, say, 80%, and France is pushing 100%. So these, these, these are interesting indicators. They don't necessarily mean uh, that the debt is unsustainable per se, but you have to put it in perspective to what the government is doing every period. That's the left-hand side, and what the government needs to do, um, which is on the right-hand side. Okay, so in words, stability of the debt-GDP ratio comes about when the ratio of primary surplus to GDP is equal to the growth adjusted debt service. Okay, so this, this key equation is a way of evaluating um, every country's fiscal policy. Is it sustainable? Now, R, what is R? R is the real rate interest rate. It was negative for almost a decade uh, by many accounts, um, depending on what rate you consider. So we're, again, we're considering the interest rate, but in general, Governments uh, use longer-term debt to finance long-term projects um, and use short-term debt um, to, uh, to smooth out fluctuations in, in revenues and um, over the short term. So we have a whole term structure of interest rates, but they, do, they move together. So if R is negative, uh, this is great news. You know, if R, if R is negative or close to zero and the economy is growing, then it doesn't really matter. We can just grow out of our obligations. But as we've seen in the recent, in the recent year, uh, the ECB just raised short-term interest rates by 400 uh, basis points or 350 basis points. As a result, long-term interest rates have also started to rise. So even in Germany, uh, where the 10-year the, uh, um, treasury bond was, was trading... Um, at a negative yield for many, many uh, quarters, uh, many years actually, um, now has a significantly positive yield of, of over 2%, which means that those holders of those bonds took very large capital losses. That's not what I'm talking about now, but it means that basically if we thought the German fiscal policy was sustainable at a zero real interest rate or a negative real interest rate, uh, we're now dealing with um, significantly higher interest rates um, they still may be negative, okay? They still may be negative. Um, I would argue that they're moving upward and they won't stay uh, negative for very long. In any case, it's the constraint that Germany would have to deal with or Greece or any other country. But in the European Monetary Union, the inflation rate is kind of the same. There may be some short-run deviations because of di differential uh, shocks, but in the long run, uh, this is the, the curse of the Monetary Union, if you think about it. And we're all accepting the same rate of inflation in the long run. And therefore, we have to really spend a lot of time thinking about G, how fast is our economy growing? 
and what is the initial condition for us in terms of our debt to GDP stock. And that's going to put the constraint on the government as to what kind of fiscal posture, what kind of deficit or surplus on the, on the left-hand side is possible. Um, and you can see that if there's a positive uh, debt to start with, okay, because the, the debt is a stock, you can't eliminate it, right? It takes many, many, many years uh, to reduce the debt to GDP ratio. It would take a long time to eliminate the stock of debt, and nobody wants to do that. Um, uh, the debt has to be um, serviced, so this debt service you can think of as is basically R times B divided by Y, and if G is growing, then the debt gets serviced by the nature of the, of the beast. Growth means more um, ta potential tax revenues, um, and therefore this problem uh, is kind of solved. Okay, so this is all related to Maastricht, because Maastricht was, a, was considered a way uh, to force governments to, to look very carefully, not just tomorrow, but also for the next 10 years, um, you know, uh, the consequences of bad fiscal policy. Because a lot of governments have the temptation to, to try to get reelected by uh, increasing spending and cutting taxes and letting the next government worry about the consequences. Um, this is not good for a monetary union as we'll see next week. Okay, so recall the, the, the Maastricht criteria, they were pretty easy to understand. 60% rule um, for debt to GDP ratio, that's our B over Y. 3% rule that you read about in the newspaper and learned uh, from last lecture uh, from the Maastricht criteria apply to the headline deficit, not the primary deficit. So you ask, well, why, why didn't they do it the right way? Well, that's a good question. Maybe. Not too many people have the uh, economic uh, wherewithal or the, the competency to understand the difference between a primary deficit and a headline deficit. Um, and maybe it's uh, too shocking for, to talk publicly about the amount of money that is being paid in interest uh, for countries that have a large debt stock. Um, but I still think we should stop thinking this is a sin. Um, it's, a, it's a consequence of trying to smooth the path of uh, expenditures relative to tax revenues, and, if, and especially if there, there are emergencies like wars or earthquakes or uh, floods and climate change, we need to, to borrow money uh, and let future generations um, share in the burden to pay for this. Okay, so we have the Maastricht criteria in the fiscal sense. We have the the 60% rule, the 3% rule, and then we have these other conditions involving inflation, long-term interest rates, and in exchange rates. You can think of those as being ways of further um, solidifying expectations and um, making sure that governments don't misbehave. Okay, and the idea is simple. We don't want governments to have really large debt stocks relative to GDP because if there is a, a, a failure to finance that, if governments become um, illiquid or in, insolvent or unwilling to service the existing debt, uh, this could cause a crisis with spillover effects for the rest of the union, and the government may desperately call the ECB uh, to bail them out. And this is really what happened in 2010 with Greece and uh, later with Italy and Spain and Portugal and Ireland, um, and uh, this is not good uh, for the stability of the overall union. Um, and it's also kind of a, a sort of an invitation to moral hazard and not to do your homework um, in good times. Okay, so Maastricht is basically about trying to enforce uh, this stability condition in the background. It is guiding the, the thought. Okay, and remember, let's just remind ourselves what those cr criteria were. Inflation has to be low. It has to be lower than the, than the average of the three lowest inflation countries in the in the uh, uh, group of countries applying for monetary union. Okay, so again, this is a, again, a kind of a Munchausen type of activity. I mean, it sounds like a, a scam, but in fact it worked. Um, all the countries, as you saw earlier, uh, were able to get their inflation rate down with the exception maybe of uh, a couple, but um, the trend was certainly there and was passed. The second one involves the expectations of, of future um, short-term interest rates and inflation, which impact into the current pricing of long-term debt. So the, uh, the condition was that the average uh, 
interest rate in the three lowest inflation countries was sort of benchmark that the candidate country had to be lower than um, plus 2%. So there was a bit of leeway given to, to risky candidates. Uh, you might consider that sort of a risk premium. Uh, and this criteria was also met. But the fiscal criteria, the ones that we, we, we talked about already, basically governments had to get their debt to GDP ratio down and their deficit, the flow increment to total um, indebtedness of the government at all levels consolidated has to be less than 3% of GDP, which means that the surplus is, the surplus is minus 3% okay, of GDP. So there's, there are many ways to, to, to ex post rationalize this. If you just plug in the numbers, 60%, 3% uh, deficit rule, assume a growth rate of say uh, 3% GDP per, per annum, which was the implicit assumption back then, way too optimistic, or a nominal uh, interest rate of 5%. Um, the criteria um, meet the stabilization um, requirement. You could also look at it a different way. Think about nominal debt basically as a, as a difference equation evolving over time as a function. This will help you understand uh, why PB is so important. PB is simply the, the total outstanding uh, debt. And anytime we have a positive headline deficit, whether it be to finance primary expenditures uh, or to service the existing debt, it has to be added to that. So, you know, uh, if, de if def is positive and PB is positive, PB in T plus one is gonna be bigger and we're gonna have something that's growing. Um, and then if nominal GDP doesn't grow fast enough to keep up with that in percentage terms, then we're gonna have a growing debt to GDP ratio, okay? So if you just divide by nominal GDP and, and massage that equation a little bit, you can see that stabilization of the ratio requires the deficit at some level uh, to obey the following equa uh, equation. And therefore, um, if you set D equals 60%, like it said in the Maastricht Treaty, and the deficit equal to 3%, um, this actually does work. Okay, so basically, um, in some trivial sense, if, uh, if the deficit and the, and, the, and, the, and the debt fulfill the Maastricht criteria, and if we assume an inflation target of 2% and real growth of 3%, the, uh, the exercise actually works. And it doesn't contradict what we had before, okay? Because uh, we, have to, we have to worry about the interest rate. And that's, that's why uh, I prefer my condition. But the condition that drove the Maastricht uh, logic, I think could probably better explain, because many of my students have, over the years have asked me, why did they choose 2%, uh, a 3% deficit, a headline deficit requirement, or a 60%? What's the logic? Well, you know, you can't get into the heads of these people. Uh, many of them are no longer around. And so it was clearly they had to do it in a political way that was acceptable and understandable and, and not that people think that we have a, um, a bunch of crazy economists uh, doing this, but some serious, uh, some serious practical, um, robust way of thinking. So I show you this, this, uh, this particular uh, formulation also explains the logic of the Maastricht Treaty, although I prefer mine because it refers to the interest rate. There's no mention of the interest rate in the previous derivation. So if you see, if you look carefully at, at the, at the debt-GDP ratio, um, after, if you think, remember again, I, I write B, minus, D, B divided by Y, it's actually PB divided by PY, but the price, the price level in terms of GDP uh, deflator cancels, so you can see that it actually never, it's never been sort of an ever-growing um, um, quantity, even for countries like Greece. There have been times when these ratios have fallen. In, it, in, in Italy, it fell from 125% um, to 100% uh, in the mid-2005. So why did that happen? Well, Italy grew fast. It grew faster. Um, and the primary surplus was um, positive enough to reduce um, the debt 
as a fraction of GDP. So it actually, even in Greece it happened. Greece is a little bit less spectacular. What's spectacular is the increase in Greece uh, around 2000. That's because GDP collapsed. I already showed you the picture at the beginning of the lecture. Okay, so in, in, in effect, you see that B over Y is driven both by B and Y over time. And you can see that um, there were good reasons before the pandemic hit to think that at least most of the countries were on a, on a pretty decent path, um, uh, maybe with the exception of Italy, um, albeit a slow path. Okay, so if you, again, if you take that logic, you can actually derive this equation that I showed you before, and it results in the same sort of, um, I'm going to skip over this rather quickly, um, you get the same um, equation that we had before. Um, so there's no conflict in, in the analysis that I had before and the, um, the one I'm showing you right now. Ultimately, for the GDP, uh, the debt to GDP ratio to be, to be uh, stabilized, the primary surplus has to be big enough um, to service the debt in a sense that it's, ex it's not just the interest rate, but it's interest rate relative to the long-term growth rate of the economy. And again, I keep stressing long-term growth rate, long-term interest rate, these, um, these symbols really do apply to sustainable levels. So just getting growth up for a couple of months or a couple of quarters, a couple of years is not enough uh, for long run sustainability. Again, thinking about the, the previous picture um, with the paths of B over Y, it's clear that the, the success that happened between 1995 and 2005 was basically the momentum of joining the monetary union, of fulfilling the Maastricht criteria. Once they were in the club, the restrictions uh, were less binding on the countries. Uh, they, in fact, they weren't binding at all. Once you joined, you're sort of, you're in, uh, try to kick me out, that sort of logic. Okay. So uh, you, can, you can try to lim link uh, my stabilization criterion uh, to this, um, to this uh, headline Maastricht cri criterion. Um, it's pretty interesting to see what it implies. If you just write the, uh, the headline deficit that has to be less than 3% of GDP as a, as a sum of the primary deficit, that's G minus T divided by Y, plus the, re the real debt service as a fraction of GDP, that's RB divided by Y. Uh, this thing can't be bigger than 3%. And if B over Y is 60%, you can just plug it in and you can see the constraint that we have between the primary um, deficit that's permissible and the real interest rate at 60%. So if a country is sitting at 60% of its GDP in terms of debt, um, it, it's really constrained by the level of interest rates. If the interest rate is high, then uh, it's going to have to run a higher uh, surplus, a lower uh, deficit uh, to meet the 3% criterion. So this is the whole problem. Okay, for a country under attack, if you believe that Greece may leave the monetary union, people who have lent money to Greece will uh, be a lot, a lot more cautious and will probably try to sell their bonds, and that will drive up the real interest rate for this country, and that's exactly what happened in 2009, 2010. Therefore, to convince the public and the lending public, <coughs> including international hedge funds, you have to do something to convince uh, them that you're going to fulfill your budget constraint. This means you're going to have to run uh, bu primary budget surpluses. So in the in, the, in Volksmund, this is called austerity, austeritate, um, and you can see where it comes from. Basically, the surplus is is uh, has to be sufficiently high to meet the three percent rule. So if interest rates are high, um, this three percent rule will be increasingly difficult to meet, especially if debt is financed at the short end. Um, of maturity. Okay, so this is this is kind of getting to the point that I'll drive home next week when we talk about the, the European sovereign debt crisis. Um, when interest rates spike like they did in in 2009, uh, in 2010, in 2011, uh, this can be a threat to the budget constraint. Even though the government was on a good track, had a primary surplus, uh, everything was hunky dory. Uh, and you can also imagine that in the, in the 2000 decade, the golden 2000 decade for the euro, when interest rates were almost identical across the government uh, 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 
10-year note spectrum, 10-year bond spectrum, uh, those were the, many governments were lulled into complacency. They weren't thinking very hard about uh, what would happen if those interest rates rised, arose, and they did rise for, for many countries. They, they actually fell for France and Germany, but they rose for everybody else. That put an extreme strain on the governments of those countries. So fiscal policy was, was quite vulnerable, and um, governments um, were forced to, to, to react. So one interpretation of what Mario Draghi did in 2012 is basically to react to this crisis and saying that uh, we're not going to let this situation blow up the euro. We're going to do all that it takes. And if that convinced the governments that the European Central Bank would do all that it take, takes, then the interest rate pressure would be, would be reduced. And if the interest rate pressure is reduced, then the, the financing constraint is less binding and the government is less likely to, to default. Talk about that next week. Okay, so if you think about it, again, manipulate the equation um, that we had before to think about the dynamics of B over Y. If you want to get B over Y down uh, after this disaster, you're going to have to do uh, one of many things, possibly in combination. Um, you can't lower interest rates in a, in a, in a, if you're a region or a participating country in a monetary union. You can certainly run higher budget surpluses. That'll raise the first term of the right-hand side or you can somehow do things that would stimulate long-term economic growth, not a flash in the pan. You need G to be high for many, many years uh, to make this work. We've assumed that G is constant, so we need a higher sustainable rate of growth. Or you can do the fourth thing, which is uh, talked about by many uh, left-wing politicians in Southern Europe, default. You screwed us. Basically, um, this is not fair. We're not going to make people suffer to repay. So you can just drop the B. You can just, um, or ask for debt forgiveness. The positive spin would be, um, we'll forgive the debt. Okay, so those are the four choices. There's not much else you can do. Maybe you can, you can try to reduce your debt by selling the family jewels. Okay, we'll talk about that next week. You could actually, like Greece, you could sell the Port of Piraeus to the Chinese and use that money to retire some debt at the margin. Um, but if you do it in a fire sale way, you'll probably depress the price that you get for the, for the family jewels, and that'll be kind of a less attractive way of doing it. Uh, Greece has often considered selling, and I think actually has sold a few islands to, to rich Arab um, um, multi-billionaires. Let's see if we can actually track that. Okay, so the left-hand side, change in the ratio. The right-hand side is just the, the manipulated differential of the left-hand side. Um, and you can see that it's three things. You know, you've got the, you got the, the debt service. You've got um, the primary surplus uh, acting negatively on this uh, evolution. Um, so you can see where the, the demand for austerity comes from. The, and the third part is the growth rate uh, raising the sustainable base of finance. Okay, so let's just, let's just take that that uh, in formal terms. Okay, so those numbers I put down are basically an example. This is the example uh, in 2015 when Greece was threatening to leave uh, and threatening very credibly to leave uh, the euro. I think Tsipras was so, was the prime minister of Greece at the time was actually thinking about how can I zap uh, purchasing power into everyone's pockets without printing money. Uh, very smart. He's an economist, maybe not smart enough. <laughs> but the idea was to use the electricity bill. So, you know, everybody gets an electricity bill. We all have an apartment, we have a house or some sort of dwelling, and um, we could just give people lots of credit on their electricity bill, and then they could, at some point in the future, convert those into the neo drachma, the new drachma. Okay. This was his bargaining, uh, to, his bargaining chip to get uh, concessions from the European Commission, from the IMF, and from the, uh, the European Central Bank. Those are the three debt holders. We'll talk about it next week in detail. But the idea was, you know, um, if we can negotiate some things. If the European Central Bank and the IMF and the, and the, um, uh, and the, uh, the European Commission, uh, Euro participating members of the European Commission, or holding this debt, then they can we, can, we can cut a deal, give a lower interest rate, a concessionary interest rate, okay, so we could, we could make R zero. We could make R actually 1% or zero. 
It, the markets may want 5% for Greece because they have such a bad reputation, but we could make it zero because we own the debt. And if, if Greece grows fast, 4%, it's really optimistic, but Greece was very, very far down, as, as you've seen. And if Greece can move to a primary surplus of 3% of GDP, um, this would be enough uh, to bring down B over Y significantly. Okay, so if you just combine those, you see that B over Y falls by seven percentage points per annum. Okay, so, and we've seen this actually in the, in the recent uh, crisis, the, the surprise inflation of the, of the past year has actually reduced the debt GDP ratio in, um, in European countries by a significant amount because it wasn't expected, it wasn't priced into the interest payments that Europe, the, European Central Bank, uh, the European economies were paying, and therefore it reduced uh, the debt burden. So this is a, um, and this wouldn't be a surprise, this would be a persistent Greek outcome um, would possibly bring down the GDP, the debt GDP ratio significantly in ra relatively short time, okay? But clearly it's probably too optimistic. It takes years and years and years to get the debt to GDP ratio up to a certain level, and it certainly will take a long time to get it down. So if you look at Greece, for example, you look at the, the long history of Greece since the, uh, the 1990s, you can see that um, inflation has come down. So the success story for Greece is really getting inflation down from 26.5% in 1989 uh, to European Monetary Union conformable levels. In fact, after the crisis, Greek inflation was negative. So inflation, the price level is falling. Um, at the same time, the Greek surplus has been persistently negative persistently negative. In fact, if you take the headline, um, there's only one year when, when it was actually, there was never a year until uh, after the financial crisis 2016 that it was ne not negative. Okay, so if you strip off the, the primary surplus, you'll have a, a, a large, a, a primary, you'll have a primary um, surplus over time, and I'll show you the, the graph. If you strip off debt interest payments, you'll have a, a positive surplus, but the headline level is, has been negative since time immemorial. So the Greeks um, only slowly learning about fiscal austerity. Maybe the good news is with the new government, uh, they'll be able to solidify the progress they actually made with the, uh, the left-wing government. Um, and now we have a conservative government there. It's very likely that Greece will have a, a good run for many, many years. And you can see this by looking at the data. Um, um, because of this um, persistent uh, headline deficit, which translated into a primary uh, deficit or a surplus inconsistent with a stabilized uh, debt to GDP ratio, uh, the debt to GDP ratio rose. But because of the, the deal they cut in 2015, uh, Greece had a concessionary interest rate. It has run primary surpluses. Uh, it's out of the program now. Uh, it's no longer being monitored by the IMF. Um, so um, I have positive expectations about the Greek situation, despite uh, the spike that uh, you can find in the debt to GDP ratio since the pandemic, um, uh, the, the long run trend seems to be going in the right direction. Okay, so let's conclude. Interest rates and real growth are both key ingredients for fiscal stability. It's not just about getting interest rates down. It, you require, it requires um, some growth in the base it also requires some fiscal discipline. You can't run deficits um, unless you have a growing economy that's going to be able to sustain uh, a debt to GDP ratio. So you can think of, of Maastricht as an insurance against this moral hazard problem. Okay? So, again, understanding Maastricht is easy now that you understand this, this equation, the other equations that I presented. Monetary policy and central banks basically operate in a, in a mutually dependent situation with fiscal policy. Governments are large players, especially the, um, a large country's government um, because it runs large deficits and it creates debt that could be eventually a problem for the central bank to, guard, to, to safeguard stability. And the governments traditionally throughout the last three centuries have tried to force the central bank uh, to finance their wars, to, uh, to bail them out, to bail out uh, financial systems, et cetera. 
And this is a potentially dangerous situation, so Master makes perfect sense. Putting on a straitjacket before we, we get into monetary bed is perfectly uh, understandable. We don't want to have this thing end in, in a complete c catastrophe. The governments own the central bank, so the seniorage of the central bank can derive uh, through its issuance of uh, liabilities that the, cent that the commercial banks hold and use a re as reserve for their lending uh, means that um, there's a source of, of, of seniorage income. And the European Central Bank has a massive balance, uh, balance sheet, uh, three trillion uh, now falling, but if you think about this, even a small interest rate applied to that, a small rate of return applied to that um, asset position means that there's gonna be some serious income and that income is redistributed to the member countries uh, after, after costs have been serviced, uh, uh, cost, servicing costs have been paid. So there is a profit, we call that seniorage. That's the advantage of having a central bank, except it's now at the European level and it's basically transferred to the member countries on the basis of their capital key. Okay, so again, the central bank is part of this intertemporal budget constraint. Governments will count on it making a profit and it has made a profit in the past. It doesn't have to be in the future. Maybe in times of, of rising interest rates or um, depreciating uh, assets, especially foreign assets, uh, this might be the case. It has not yet been the case with the European Central Bank. The European Central Bank um, has a lot of, um, of firepower um, and a lot of potential to help governments finance their own deficits, but not as a, as a discretionary uh, source. Okay, so keeping that in mind means that basically um, there's a lot of pressure on uh, governments to do fiscal policy correctly, and you can even use the Barrow-Gordon logic to think about fiscal policy, uh, committing to a fiscal policy because you want to tie your hands and not get into trouble when things go, go south. Okay, so I'll finish up by talking about the progress that Europe has made in this respect. So there has been some... There, there has been some progress. There has been some progress in fiscal compliance uh, since this disaster that I'll talk about next week. Um, the Stability and Growth Pact uh, failed in a large extent to discipline those countries um, that were kind of uh, tempted to violate the rules back in the early 2000s. I'm thinking not about Southern Europe, I'm thinking about Germany and France. Um, um, and I think the Southern European countries looked at Germany and France and saw them violating the Maastricht criteria in 2003. These are the two biggest players, and if they can do it, why can't we do it? I think there was a lot of, uh, of, of um, upset politicians in Northern Europe when they saw this happen. Um, so in a sense, all countries are guilty. You can't just blame Southern Europe. You have to blame Germany and France as well. Uh, it's really all about tail risks, about extreme events that can cause um, uh, a crisis, a run on a uh, country's debt, etc. So keeping your powder dry is important. It's important for European countries um, to have some fiscal discipline in good times and uh, just to keep ready for a situation um, when things can get bad. So the Stability and Growth Pact was, um, was enacted to ensure that countries even just obey some part of the fiscal and, mo and rule, monetary rules that were imposed to get into the club. So this is after the club has been you formed, you join the club, you fulfill the conditions, but you don't obey the rules anymore. You need new rules. The Germans pushed very hard for the Stability and Growth, rate, growth Pact um, to continue to, um, in a way consistent with the treaty, basically to prevent countries from getting out of control. Uh, this was only successful in a limited sense because they weren't really thinking about the big crisis that we had in 2008, 9, and uh, 10, 11. There's been some um, reforms. Actually, uh, the French pushed making these reforms uh, um, less, uh, making the, the new rules less strict. Um, so we have something called the Euro Pact uh, Plus uh, in, involving more cooperation, uh, but no really hard term penalties. Um, the original Maastricht Treaty um, the original Stability and Growth Pact actually had penalties for those countries that violated uh, the 2% rule consistently um, in terms of a, an impost or a, uh, a tax on uh, related to GDP. 
uh, but these have never been imposed, and I think um, no one has a taste for that, especially since Germany and France were the, the initial sinners. Adam and Eve basically uh, didn't get punished, so in the end, they got it in the end. Okay, so we, you know, in the meantime, more rules and regulations, cl classical European approach, regulations on strengthening surveillance and exchange of information, macroeconomic imbalance procedure. Um, at the same time, very few penalties. So they're, they're kind of toothless tigers. Um, and in the end, we're talking about a, basically the European semester trying to uh, harmonize uh, national budgetary procedures. So at least we have some exchange of information, some coordination of fiscal policy, and to reduce the margin of fiscal fiscal intervention by, by parliaments. Finally, I'd like to talk about supply-side policies. The ECB cannot do anything about supply-side policies. It's not their job, but the commission can do something. They can actually in, in, um, worry that maybe too much austerity can hurt infrastructure, hurt the very backbone of an economy uh, that helps economic potential. So it makes more sense maybe to do other types of supply-side policies, sustaining uh, new firms, New, new entry, uh, new, uh, uh, less burdensome regulation, especially now with the energy transition, trying to move to renewables, it's important to help startups get, get going. Um, the last credible version of this 2017 doing business indicator shows that uh, only a few European countries are in the, in the Bundesliga of, um, of ease of doing business, and they're all in Scandinavia. So interestingly enough, these are countries that have a very large social welfare system, but have a light touch on regulation, a light touch on starting businesses, a light touch on um, ease of exit. In fact, in Denmark, they don't even have um, job protection. There's no such thing as Kündigungsschutz. So it's a, it's a relationship between unions and management. Um, and yet they have a very generous social welfare system. Okay, so, and they have high taxes. So, you know, you don't have to, uh, believe the, the myth that high taxes means poor countries. I don't see, um, um, I don't see the high Scandinavian countries um, doing, uh, the high tax Scandinavian countries doing so bad. It's easy to start a business. If you are successful and make lots of money, you have to pay your taxes and you get to take advantage of a very good infrastructure. Similarly, uh, in the second um, Liga, you see a lot of European countries, but not the ones we'd hoped for. Germany is just making it tw number 20, and France is uh, not even in the top uh, 30. And then you've got um, the others at the bottom. So Italy, classically, has been at the bottom. A lot of pressure to do better. It is doing better, um, but you see it is not even the worst. Greece, coming from 100 in, uh, in 2010, is now around 67. Okay, so there's still too much regulation, too much red tape um, would help uh, to synchronize this and make it easier to start businesses uh, in those countries. Okay, so these, these so-called structural reforms have been evaluated, and it turns out that the crisis countries, after all this pressure, have, a, have started to reform. This is a study that the OECD published showing that um, the um, crisis countries that have um, responded most to the pressure to reform are exactly those countries that are now um, coming out of, the, out of the, the dumpster and doing quite well. The highest growth uh, registered in the EU in the past year is exactly Greece, Portugal, and Ireland, um, and Spain. And despite the, the Russian crisis, Germany is not doing so well. Okay, so keep all in, this all in mind. At the same time, we're moving towards the so-called new generation EU. The idea is to fund new initiatives. It was initially the pandemic in response to that. We have other challenges in Europe, most importantly being the energy uh, transition, moving to uh, renewable sources of energy is gonna cost uh, at least 600 billion uh, euros in this country in the next 10 years. Uh, if we wanna meet the climate uh, target, it's gonna be at least uh, three times that for the entire European Union. So we're talking two trillion. It's a lot of investment. Um, stretch that over 10 years, it's still a lot of investment. So some fiscal stimulus might be inter worth doing, uh, and some stimulus of that action might be worth doing in terms of subsidies or direct finance uh, by some EU supranational agency, but there isn't any, there is no central government, uh, so the EU recovery fund is seen as an initial effort in this direction. So creating this fund, 
uh, at the tune of 750 billion was a response to the pandemic and it will persist over the future. It's not exactly the Hamilton moment because even if they issue bonds, it won't be enough to displace the national bonds, but the hope is that this new type of debt, this European debt, would, would be even better than holding bunds and take some of the pressure off the, the German um, um, bond market in the sense that if there is a crisis, people rush to safety. Uh, it's really a, not so great to have this asymmetry within the European um, financing system. It would make more sense to have a centralized government um, source of, of debt that would provide a, um, a safe haven for European uh, diversification needs. Okay, so I'm finished. Um, let's talk about the, the key concepts. Remember these, uh, remember those formula. They're gonna be important for the final exam. Have a nice week and I'll see you next, next uh, Tuesday.